Hello and welcome to the Data in Brief webinar series. My name is Sven Kotowski, and I'm a scientific editor for Data in Brief. In this webinar, I will provide guidance on how to fill in the Data in Brief submission template. Specifically, this webinar is about Data in Brief's template for data articles, which form an integral part of the Data in Brief submission process. Note that we also provide webinars on other facets of Data in Brief, such as on repositories on which to share data, or on the submission process in general. You can find links to these other webinars, as well as to other helpful pages in the video description. I will assume that you at least roughly know what Data and Brief is. So it'll suffice to say that we're an Elsevier open access, multidisciplinary, peer-reviewed data journal. We mostly publish data articles. And unlike full-length research articles that provide theory, results, and discussion, Data articles are short papers, usually around 10 pages in length, that only provide access to and describe data sets. By doing so, data articles contribute to open science and to fair principles, that is, they allow for findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable data. The immediate benefits for authors are that data articles offer a route to an additional, fully citable publication. If you want to find out more about DIB or about fair principles, please visit the links at the bottom of the slide. Let us now talk about the submission template more specifically. The template for data articles can be found on Elsevier's homepage under the link elsevier.com forward slash dib minus template. We're using a template for a number of reasons. Most importantly though, the template is there to make sure that all our published data articles are coherent and follow a common set of principles. The template thus ensures that data articles contain everything that is necessary for describing a data set, but nothing else that this information is structured in a consistent way across articles, which allows for easy retrieval of information. The data articles remain brief. And finally, that the writing process itself is easy and straightforward. Let us now have a closer look at the template itself. What you see here is the very first page of the template proper. This page asks you to provide the most general information on your article for example, on its title, the authors of the article, their affiliations, etc. Please note that the abstract should be on the described data set only, not on results or discussion. We can also use this page for introducing the general layout of our template. On the left-hand side, we find the main body of the template. In black, such as in the red box here, you find section and subsection headings. In blue italics, such as in the green box here, you find instructional text that you will delete and replace with your own relevant information and text. On the right-hand side, such as in the blue box here, you find comment boxes. These comment boxes include editor tips and hints and further instructional text. Please delete those boxes before you submit your manuscript. Following the article information, the specifications table provides a concise overview of your data set. The table is divided into eight rows and two columns. The left column provides headers for each row, while you provide information inside the right column. As before, you replace the text in blue italics with your own data set descriptions, and the DIB editor comment boxes provide you with valuable information and hints. The first six rows of the specifications table are relatively straightforward and you're asked to provide information on your dataset subject area, whether your dataset contains only raw or also analyzed or filtered data, and what kind of visual elements, such as tables, images, or graphs, your dataset contains. The data collection row asks for a brief overview of the data acquisition process, while the data source location row asks for specifying where the data were collected and or where they are stored. In case your dataset contains secondary data, the data source location row is also where you list your primary data sources. The last two rows of the specifications table are slightly more complex. In the data accessibility row, you specify the repository on which you have deposited your data set, including its name, the persistent identifier for the data, a direct URL, and if necessary, further instructions for data access. Failure to properly fill in this row is the most common cause for us to send back manuscripts to the authors. 
This is because making your data set accessible is a prerequisite for publishing with data in brief. And access to the data is necessary for reviewers. Make sure that your link allows for access to the published current version of your data set. In the video description, you can find links to Data and Brief's overview of supported repositories, as well as a webinar on the topic. The role related research article is in fact optional, as you can submit both a standalone data article, as well as a data article that describes the raw data you use in a full length research article. If your data article supports a related research article, please cite this article here using the guidance provided in the relevant comment box. Please note that we require related research articles to make use of the same data set that is described in the data article, to be written in English, and to be at least accepted for publication in a peer-reviewed journal. Related articles also have to share at least one co-author with the data article, and we require that you upload a copy of the article during your submission to Data in Brief. Obviously, you can still regularly cite other relevant research papers of yours that do not fulfill the criteria just mentioned. For example, if they are written in a language other than English. This can be done either in the value of the data or in the data description sections, to which we turn now. The value of the data section is essentially a data set's advertisement. It serves several purposes. First, it shows that your data set has value to the research community and states who specifically can benefit from these data in which ways. Second, it briefly points out the reason for which you generated the data set. Third, it thus provides you with the opportunity to advertise your data set and potentially increase its usage and the data paper citations. Please know that we ask you to fill in the section using bullet points. Some of these bullet points are already provided in the form of questions, and you're asked to address these questions and be direct and specific when doing so. The background section provides you with an opportunity to provide the general context that led you to generate the data set. It serves two main purposes. First, it describes the theoretical or methodological background against which the data set was generated. Second, it has an auxiliary function as it helps to keep the focus of the following two sections on the data set itself. It is to these sections that we turn now, starting with the data description. How you fill in the following section, the data description, will very much depend on the type of data you describe. However, this section's sole purpose is to clearly and unambiguously describe the structure of the data set. This way, it enables other researchers to easily understand the data set and reuse it as intended by you. Therefore, this section should name all folders and files stored on your repository, and it should describe which variables the individual files encode. You are encouraged to use visual aids, such as tables or graphs, to help describe your raw data, but you should not provide any theoretical background, statistical analyses, interpretations, or conclusions. Just as for the data description section, the nature of your experimental design, materials, and methods section is dependent on your data. In general, however, this section asks you to lay out the scientific protocol that you followed, and to describe the tools that you used and the conditions that were present during the acquisition of the raw data. This is essential for other researchers who want to evaluate the quality of your data set, who want to reproduce the data set as it is, or who want to partly improve the data set using different materials or methods. To this end, you should also, for example, provide code that you used for data analysis, or describe on which basis you designed questionnaires and how you distributed them. This section should not provide statistical analyses, interpretations, or conclusions. In case you're describing secondary data, this section provides the venue at which you describe how you added value to a primary data set that you did not generate yourself. Please also see the link in the video description to data that are suitable for data in brief. The following section, the limitations section, is essentially non-obligatory and you may choose to fill in none or not applicable. In our experience, however, all data sets have their limitations one way or another. Describing limitations provides an even fuller picture of the data set, and it provides you with an opportunity to address potentially controversial aspects of your data set. 
Moreover, it gives other researchers the opportunity to make better future use of your data. Given the sensitivity of many data sets, it is of paramount importance that you follow ethical guidelines both during data acquisition and data publication. When filling in your ethics statement, please make sure you understand the regulations that are in place for the kind of data you describe in your article. These may differ depending on whether you, for example, conduct research on human subjects in general or on medical patients specifically, whether you run animal experiments or make use of social media data. Please read the descriptions provided in this template section carefully and have a look at the links we provide to relevant websites in the video description below. Failure to properly fill in the ethics statement is another frequent reason we have to send back manuscripts. The final four sections, the credit author statement, the acknowledgements, the competing interest declaration, and the references are fairly straightforward again. Please follow the instructions, including the respective comment boxes, to make sure that you use Elsevier's uniform credit author statement format, that you use a standard way of acknowledging funding, that you provide a clear statement on whether any authors have competing interests, and that you follow data and briefs numbered citation style and provide references for your related research article and your data repository. We hope that this webinar has provided you with guidance on how to fill in data and brief submission template. As we have seen, the template fulfills the purpose of keeping data articles short and structured on the one hand, and maximizes findability and reusability of data sets on the other hand. Again, you can download the template under elsevier.com forward slash dip minus template. And you can find many valuable links in the video description as well as in the template itself. You now should also have a better idea of which pieces of information are indispensable in which section of our data articles, as well as which topics typically should not be addressed in a data article. Our experience has shown that you should pay special attention to the data accessibility row in the specifications table, to the data description section, and to the ethics statement. If you still have any questions on how to fill in our template, or want to know anything else related to DIP, please have a look at our website or contact us via the email address dib-me at elsevier.com. We have now reached the end of this presentation. Thank you very much for your time. Hopefully, you have enjoyed this webinar. We are looking forward to receiving your data article at Data and Brief.